Well, one of the, um, I think, tragedies of COVID-19 is that it has proven that Americans are lazy and they don't want to work. In fact, do you know COVID produced 13% unemployment rate? And today's workers, people that are working today, say low wages and feeling unappreciated has led them to quit in droves. And this, of course, has created a work shortage. If you go out to eat uh, this afternoon at lunch, uh, you may find that you have to wait a while for a table, and then you get a table, and there's only a couple of waiters or waitresses because people don't want to work. There might be one cook in the kitchen. I have learned now that if you need to order a refrigerator or microwave or something like that, you're good to maybe three months before you're going to even get one. Uh, medical, I, I know my brother fell and he's been waiting for surgery like for three or four months. And so everything has just been pushed back because people don't want to work anymore. They just quit their job and take money from the government. And I know a lot of people, they, they get work to, to uh, hope that they can get something out of it instead of the attitude that I think is more Christ-like is the job is what can I do for my boss? What can I do for my employer? Also, uh, they're not satisfied with their, their pay. And so they would rather just stay home and collect from the government. And that's not really the proper attitude for a believer. And we are driven, unfortunately, by a society that is greedy and lazy. And we want to do a little bit of work for a lot of money. <laughs> And some people don't want to live within the means that God has provided for them through their husband. And so we certainly have veered far from a biblical view of a God-honoring work ethic. And uh, quite frankly, we are rearing a generation of lazy children that really don't want to work. And I don't know what this country is going to look like in 20 or 30 years. I probably will be gone. I won't have to see it. So that's a good thing. <laughs> But uh, the Apostle Paul has a lot to say about work as we cover this most important topic of being employed by our Heavenly Master. So let's see what he has to say. Ephesians 6, Ephesians 6, 5 through 9. Bond servants, be obedient to those who are your masters according to the flesh with fear and trembling and sincerity of heart as to Christ, not with eye service as men pleasers, but as bond servants of Christ doing the will of God from the heart with good will doing service as to the Lord and not to men, knowing that whatever good anyone does, he will receive the same from the Lord, whether he is a slave or free. And you masters, you do the same things to them, giving up your threatening, knowing that your own master is in heaven, and there is no partiality with him. I'm thankful for that. Well, last week we got started a uh, foot in the door with Ephesians 6, and uh, we looked at uh, the children's twofold responsibility to the parent. First of all, a child, this would be someone under the age of 12, they are to obey their parents. And the Greek word is akuo. They listen under, they listen to the command of the parent, and they're to obey with a joyful heart. And if they do not, there should be a consequence for that. We also saw they're to honor their parents. Uh, they are to honor them and by respecting them, revering them, and even as they age, uh, Paul says to Timothy, you're to requite your parents, take care of your parents. And if you don't, uh, the Bible says you're worse than an unbeliever, so you're to make sure your parents are cared for and looked after, especially in their old age. And we saw that if a child will do that, there's, a, there's two blessings for him or her. It will go well with them and... They will live long on the earth. And we looked at some examples in the Bible of, of men who they didn't treat their parents right, and it didn't go well with them, and they didn't live long on the earth. And so uh, it's a good motivation to honor and obey your parents. So it will go well with you and that you will live long on the earth. But we also saw the parents have a responsibility. Parents have responsibilities as well, threefold responsibility to their children. They're not to provoke their children to anger, and I looked at 25 ways from Lou Prioli's book, The Heart of Anger, on ways that parents provoke their children, and then some from John MacArthur. And ladies, there's a lot of ways that, that you as a parent can provoke your child uh, to anger, and so you need to be sensitive to that, be aware of that. Also, uh, 
Second and thirdly, we saw that we're to bring them up in the nurture and admonition of Christ. Nurture is discipline, and we took some time to go through the Proverbs on the importance of, of disciplining your child while there is hope. Don't spare for his crying. If you beat him with the rod, he won't die. <laughs> and, uh, and I will tell you, if you'll do it young, while they're little, you won't have problems when they get older. I know we were pretty strict, and, and by the age of three, four, we had them pretty much under control. Thank God for that. But, uh, you know, the discipline. But we, all, we also saw you don't want to just be spanking your kids all the time. You also bring them up in encouragement, words of encouragement. Tell, you, tell them you love them. You hug them. You spend time with them. You pray for them. Uh, you pay attention to them. You don't ignore them. And so uh, we looked at that as our third responsibility to our children. And this might seem strange where Paul is going with the slaves and the masters, but it's really not. He's just continuing talking about household relationships, and we'll talk about uh, what he means by that in just a minute. So I do have an outline for you this morning. We're going to be looking at the responsibility of the slaves in verses 5 to 8, and then secondly, the responsibilities of the masters in verses, verse 9. So the responsibility of the slaves and the responsibility of the masters. Let's look first of all at the responsibility of the slaves to the masters. First of all, Paul says they're to be obedient to their masters. And you might be wondering, so why is he placing this here? He's just talked about we've had the, the marriage relationship, the husband's responsibility, the wife's responsibility, the child's responsibility, the parent's responsibility. And now he's talking about slaves and masters. Well, in the biblical world about this time in the Roman Empire, there were about 60 million slaves. And so slaves actually lived uh, with their masters. And so most of them were born into slavery. They were the, the byproduct of a, of a mother, uh, father, and so they were actually born into slavery. And, you know, we look at slavery a little bit different in the biblical world. Uh, slavery, uh, when someone was a slave, they would do a lot of the work that even the master would do. Uh, sometimes slaves even had medical professions. Sometimes they would uh, take care of the children. They would take care of the home. They would do the gardening. And so they had a lot of the same job or requirements or responsibilities as even the master did. But there was one difference in the sense that uh, slaves were uh, looked down on sometimes. Uh, they were looked on, at as tools, uh, sometimes as objects of uh, sex, which is not good, but sometimes they were looked at as not more than an animal. And they really could not do anything unless they had their master's permission. That was one thing that was very different. And many times they were put to death if they tried to run away. And we have Onesimus in Philemon. Remember, he was a runaway slave. And uh, Paul tells Philemon, he says, hey, you know, if he stole anything from you, he says, put that on my account. So, but in the biblical world, a lot of times if a slave ran away, uh, they could be put to death. And so that's just a little bit of some differences in their culture and our culture uh, when we look at employee-employer relationship. So in verse 5, Paul calls them to render service or to obey their master. Um, a slave, that's what they did. They had to obey their master. And so if you're taking notes, this is the first responsibility, and that is to obey. Interesting, same Greek word as we had last year, or last year, goodness. I feel like last year. I've been up since 1.30, but anyway. So I'm not responsible for anything I say. I am. <laughs> yeah, great. <laughs> I am responsible before God. James 3, don't be many teachers. I will be responsible. Uh, last week, remember Akuo, listen under, you listen to the command of your, your parent and you obey with a, with a joyful heart. Same Greek word here. Slaves are to obey their masters. They listen to the command and they obey. So if the master says, go pick the grapes out of the vineyard, the, the slave does it with a joyful heart. Uh, in our culture, if your boss says, you know, I need that report uh, by 8 o'clock in the morning, you have it done by 8 o'clock in the morning. And this is, this is hard for us, isn't it? We don't like anyone telling us what to do. And I think that's why a lot of people today quit their jobs. They don't like their employer telling them what to do. Uh, so we quit our job and we get another job. But you know, in the biblical world, you couldn't do that. 
uh, it, you know, in the biblical world, you would go out and work and do the work for the day, and you would be pay paid a denaria, which was enough for your day's wages, and then you would have to go out and purchase food at the market so you could eat. And so if you didn't work, you didn't eat. And I was thinking about this. I wish we would do that, <laughs> you know. Uh, you know, Paul even tells the church at Thessalonica about church discipline. If that man doesn't work, don't let him eat. He shouldn't even be eating. And so uh, and I think that would help some in our culture who tend to uh, want to be lazy and not do anything and want the government to provide for them. And so sometimes I think we need to get back to what they did in the biblical world. If you don't work, you don't eat. And so um, anyway, they were to obey the spoken word. Now, we're, since we're talking about slaves' responsibilities to masters, it's important that we define what a master is in the biblical world. This was someone who was supreme in authority. He is Lord, but notice he's not the Lord because Paul's very clear, you obey your master according to the flesh. What's he saying? Your earthly master. He's not talking about our heavenly master, but your earthly master. So the second responsibility of the slave to the master is that their attitude should be as one of fear and trembling, he says. Fear and trembling. Now, this doesn't mean they, they're scared to death, they're, they're cowering in fear. It just means respect. They're not only to obey their master, but they're ha to have a respect for their master. And again, we're failing in our culture. Um, when we go to work, whether it's a fast food place like Chick-fil-A, McDonald's, or if it's a, a oil company or a medical profession, and we have someone in authority over us, um, it's rare that you see a respect for authority. And I've read many times where people just get angry at their boss and, and they tell him, him off or her off and they just walk out. Well, you couldn't do that. <laughs> You couldn't do that in the biblical world or you wouldn't be eaten that night. And so, but they're to have a respect. And, and ladies, we've lost respect for authority just across the board. I mean, we've talked about this before. We've lost it in the church. We've lost it in the home. Uh, we've lost it in the, in the office. We, we've lost it every, for police officers, for government. We have no respect. And um, that's not how it should be for us as Christians. But slaves would dread to offend their masters because if they did, it would mean punishments. And masters would often control their slaves by fear to get them to do what they wanted to do. But Paul says, slaves, you obey out of reverence and fear, not of your uh, earthly master, but be afraid of offending Christ. That's what he says, as to Christ. Well, the third attitude of the slave to the master is there to have a sincerity of heart. Sincerity of heart. This means their hearts are free from improper motives, a heart that's genuine. Uh, they're, they're working so that um, they're not trying to climb the success ladder. They're not working for more money. They have no secret motives for what they're doing. They just do it as unto the Lord. They do their duty. Just do what's expected of them. And uh, I'd like to say if, if uh, we today would obey this verse, uh, it would certainly do away with a lot of complaining at work, wouldn't it, about a situation or a boss. Just, just do your work and do it from a sincere heart. Be a woman of integrity. Do your job and get it done, and then you can go home, right? <laughs> now, I want to say this before we go on. There would be an exception to this command when it talks about uh, slaves obeying their masters, and that would be if a master would ask them to sin, and a Christian slave could not obey that. We've already had that with the husband-wife relationship. If a husband asks a wife to sin, she doesn't sin. She obeys the Lord over her husband. If a child is asked by a parent to sin, uh, again, it has to be done in a very gracious, loving way, but a child doesn't sin. Uh, they have to let their parents know they cannot do that. But we have a wonderful example in Scripture. Um, remember in Exodus chapter 1 when uh, the Israelites were becoming stronger and stronger and Pharaoh was afraid that uh, as these, these women had babies that they would grow up and be strong and he wasn't going to be able to fight uh, the strength of the Israelites. And so remember what he told the Hebrew midwives? 
He said, when you do the work of a midwife, if it's a baby girl, you can let her live. But if it's a baby boy, while it's coming out, I want you to kill him. Kill the baby boy. So there's your first example of abortion in the Bible. Just kill it. And remember what Exodus 1 says? It says the Hebrew midwives would not do that. They let the babies live. They didn't, they didn't obey their master. They didn't obey the king. And uh, this is a good example. When someone asks you to sin, you don't do that. And so you know what it says after that? The Lord blessed them. The Lord blessed the midwives for not obeying the king. And ladies, the Lord will bless you if you choose to obey the Lord over any earthly authority. He will bless you. And I know it's hard sometimes, especially a husband-wife relationship. You might receive persecution uh, for not being obedient in that area. But remember, the Lord, you want to honor the Lord in your life above anyone else, any, including any earthly authority. Uh, for example, in our world, if you're at a job and your uh, employer would ask you to uh, lie, uh, this is income tax time. If he were to ask you to lie on income taxes for the company, you don't do it. You don't do it. Or uh, he, if he offers you a raise, if you'll give him sexual favors, you don't do it. <laughs> you don't do it. And so there would be many times that uh, employers, especially today, would probably uh, ask someone who is employed by him to lie, to cheat, to steal, or do something like that. And uh, I know Christians who have lost their jobs for standing up for what is right. And uh, we stand up for what's right, right, even if we're persecuted. Well, Paul continues on with the responsibility of the slaves to the masters in verse 6. He says, not with eye service as men pleasers. So the fourth responsibility of the slave to, is, to do their, is to not do their work, sorry, with eye service. The Greek word means sight labor. <laughs> What's it saying? So you only do your work when the master's watching you, you know? But as soon as the master does something else, then you don't do your work anymore. Uh, you know, I, I, find, I find it funny. I don't know about you, but I've seen sometimes when I'm uh, looking out my office window or sometimes when I'm out driving around and I see people uh, blowing the leaves and, you know, instead of bagging them, they blow them in the street. Uh, but let me tell you, I bet if their boss was standing right there, they would not do that. Um, or, you know, you're, you're at an office desk job and you're playing a game on your phone uh, or you're texting your wife or you're whatever you're doing and the boss comes in, well, you're going you're gonna to put that aside, right? And so that's what you're doing it for eye service. But if the boss is right there, you're looking like you're working. And Paul says don't do that. Don't just do your work as if your boss is watching you. Ladies, we should realize the heavenly master is watching us all the time. And ladies, we're going to give an account to him for everything we've done in our body, whether it's good or whether it's bad. And that includes, uh, you know, playing these games with each other that, you know, I, I only do my thing when you're watching. But, you know, God is watching. And I love what Charles Haddon Spurgeon says, what you are at home is what you are. Remember, he's watching you there, too, when you think you can get by uh, with being lazy. The fifth attitude that should be present in slaves is they should not be men pleasers. They should not be men pleasers. This is an old word that means man courting, or we might say working only to please his master. Uh, you know, he wants to get in good with the boss. Ladies, we want to get in good with the boss. You know, God, right? We want to do our work to please God. Paul says in the sister epistle in Colossians, bond servants, obey your masters according to flesh, not with eye service as men pleasers, but in sincerity of heart, doing whatever you do as hardly as unto the Lord, not unto men. Why? Knowing you will receive the reward of your inheritance for you serve the Lord Christ. Ladies, the things we do, we don't do to impress others. We do it for pleasing the Lord. In fact, I would just say uh, in any vocation or anything that you're involved in, if you do anything just to please somebody, that, that's a really serious issue. Uh, Paul says in Galatians, if I seek to please men, I'm not a servant of Christ. And so I often even ask myself in what I do, why do I do what I do? Uh, is it to please men? Is it to please God? Who am I trying to, who am I trying to impress any? Why do I do what I do? And ladies, you should ask yourself that. 
Uh, and, and Paul is telling the slaves, don't do your work just to get in good with your master, just to please your master. You better be concerned about pleasing your heavenly master, right? And often I tell myself uh, when I get up to teach sometimes in these places and I know the message is not going to be received, uh, I'll say, you know, it doesn't really matter if it is. I've got to worry about pleasing the Lord, right, and not worry about pleasing my audience. And so uh, the slaves needed to keep in mind not to be man pleasers but to be God pleasers. And I know, um, you know, some of us think that – you know, that it's only that Google that's watching us all the time, but God's watching us too. So, and uh, in fact, one time someone told me, they go, I'm just scared to death because, you know, I know that Google sees everything I do and knows everything I do and knows where I'm at, knows I've just been to this restaurant three months ago. And I was like, you better be more concerned about God watching you than Google watching you. But it is kind of creepy when they say, you were here three months ago and this is what you ordered. I'm like, that's really creepy, but... Uh, but everything is naked and open to the eyes of him with whom we have to do, right? He knows everything. Well, instead of being a man pleaser, Paul says a slave should be a bond servant of Christ who does the will of God from the heart. So the sixth responsibility of the slave is that you recognize you are a bond servant of Christ working wholeheartedly from your innermost being. Ladies, do your work as unto the Lord, not unto men. Um, We're going to give an account for everything we've done in our body, whether good or bad. And so uh, the slave works knowing the heavenly master is watching him. Even if you don't receive a promotion at work, (laughs) right? It's okay. It's okay. You have food and clothing, be content, right? And we have a heavenly master that we need to please and not an earthly master. Now, Paul goes on to verse 7 to say this, with goodwill doing service to the Lord and not to men. So the seventh responsibility of the slave is to serve with goodwill, which means a cheerful heart, a positive attitude. Um, I think Christians should be the happiest employments. Uh, Debbie and I were in, I don't know where it was, a couple weeks ago we were somewhere and they took us uh, to oh, it was t- Florida, and they took us to lunch, and uh, the gal waiting on us, I thought, man, she forgot her devotions this morning or something. She was one of the most miserable employees. But uh, that should not be for us. Uh, no matter where we work or what we do, we should, be, we should be the happiest of all creatures. And so when you're working outside the home or, or whatever, it should be that there should be joy there. Uh, my husband used to wor- use the word winsome. <laughs> we should be winsome, right? We should have a positive, happy attitude, uh, even if maybe the job we're doing isn't that much fun. Ladies, we need to be focused on we are doing this as unto the Lord, and we're representing Christ uh, even in the workplace. And so uh, we need to be inviting um, as we think about this. Well, Paul reminds them again of something he already said, as that is they're doing this to the Lord and not to men. Why? Because there's a bigger issue at hand, ladies, and if you could keep this in mind, whether your work is at home or out in the workforce, there's a bigger issue at hand. Look at verse 8. Look what he says. Knowing whatever good you do, you're going to receive the same from the Lord, whether you are a slave or free. Now, putting ourselves in the slave shoes, this would be an encouragement to them. Because as a slave born into the house of a master, they would have no inheritance. A true son or daughter would have an inheritance from the master, the father, but not a slave. And so Paul is reminding them, even though you haven't been born into the house of this, I mean, you're not the true son, you are one day going to receive an inheritance, and that's going to be a good deal. So Obey my commands here, what I've told you to do as far as being a slave, and you're going to receive the same thing that your master's going to receive, and that is an inheritance. In fact, look back at Ephesians 1. We've had some of these already. I know we've slept a lot since then, but uh, I can't believe we're about done with this study. But Ephesians 1, 11, uh, this, I, I love these first chapters on our inheritance. In whom also you have re- t- obtained an inheritance being predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things after the counsel of his own will. And then in verse 14, 
He is the earnest. Jesus is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession to the praise of his glory. Verse 18, that the eyes of your understanding will be enlightened. You may know what is the hope of his calling and what is the riches of the glory of his inheritance to the saints. And Paul has set this forth in the beginning of the letter. You guys have an inheritance. And it doesn't matter if you're a slave. doesn't matter if you're a master. doesn't matter if you're male, female, uh, Jew, Greek. It doesn't matter. Uh, we all have an inheritance. And so Paul is reminding them, it might be hard now what you have to do and, and obeying your master for the, you know, the spoken word and, and reverencing him and being respectful to him, but there's a bigger issue. And the issue is we're all going to stand before the Lord on that day knowing whatever we do, we're going to receive from the Lord whether we are a slave or free. Even though the earthly master doesn't see uh, the good they have done, their master in heaven has seen the good you have done. And Paul is encouraging them with that. Well, just in case the masters or the bosses think they're off the hook with how they behave, Paul reminds them they are not. <laughs> they have a very sobering charge. I think it's more sobering than the slave, honestly, just like I think the husband has a more sobering responsibility than the wife. Look at verse 9. You masters, you do the same things to them, Give up your threatening, knowing your own master also is in heaven. There's no partiality with him. <laughs> now, ladies, when you look at this verse very carefully, you come to the conclusion it's actually the masters that have the more sobering responsibility, evidenced by the words, look at the words, do the same things to them. Do what things to who? The things I've just told the slaves to do, you got to do it too. <laughs> you have to have the same attitude to the slave. You have to obey your master. You have to have respect for him. You're to serve with sincerity of heart. You're to realize the eye of the Lord is on you. You're not to be man pleasers. You're to do your work wholeheartedly with a cheerful heart. So they think they're off the hook. They're not. Paul says, you do everything I just told the slave to do, but you got one more thing. You can't threaten him. <laughs> You cannot threaten your slave. Now, ladies, you have to think Roman. You have to think the 60 million slaves were there. They were treated nothing more than a tool, uh, a sex slave or whatever. But for a Christian master, Christ comes in and changes the culture. He says you can't do this. You can't threaten your slaves. You can't beat your slaves. You can't have sex with your slaves. You can't treat them like a tool. Christ died for them too. And so you treat them with respect. Why? Because you have a master in heaven. <laughs> and there's no partiality with him. And on judgment day, masters, employer, employers, you're not going to get a king's ex on judgment day because you think you're the head honcho. <laughs> you're going to stand before God and give an account just like those who work for you. And so be careful how you treat them. Do not threaten them. You treat them as if you would treat them as an equal. Ladies, this is a, this is a really high calling for any of us who have people under us that work for us, right? Uh, we need to remember we also are going to give an account to the Lord. It's kind of the same thing that um, Peter tells the pastors. I think this is really good when he tells them not to be in the pastorate for money, for greed, or lording things over people, but he says you're to do it willingly because you love the body, and then he reminds them, on that day, pastors, you're going to stand before the chief shepherd, <laughs> and you're going to give an account for how you've treated your flock, and that's kind of terrifying, right, for some pastors who haven't treated their flock very well, but one day they're going to give an account to the chief shepherd, and that's exactly kind of what Paul is saying here. Masters, bosses, you're going to give an account. And so don't think that you can be unkind or treat someone with less respect than you would even treat someone in your own family. Ladies, I want to bring this out because we've been talking about a lot of leadership. Husbands, we've been talking about uh, parents. But just because you have a place of position of authority doesn't give you any right to treat people uh, as not made in the image of God. And we have a higher we're going to have a higher accountability. I think about that for my own self. As a teacher of the word of God, 
Uh, James says, my brethren, don't be many teachers. Don't run into that office of a teacher. Why? Knowing you're going to receive a stricter judgment. Why? Because of the things I teach and how I live my life. <laughs> so I'm, I'm going to be held to strict account. Uh, our president, uh, he's going to be held to a stricter account. Kings, pastors, husbands, and masters, bosses, they're going to be held to a stricter account. So the responsibility of the slave to the master, they obey their masters, they respect their masters, they serve with a sincere heart. They're not to work only when the master is watching. They're not to be a man pleaser. They're to work wholeheartedly as a bondservant of Christ, and they do their work with a cheerful heart. The responsibilities of the master are the very same, but added to that, they cannot threaten their slaves. Now, you might be saying, Susan, this has nothing to do with me. <laughs> I'm not a slave. I'm not a master. Sure you are. <laughs> sure you are. A lot of you probably feel like slaves, especially those girls back at that table. Slave to the dishes, slave to the laundry, slave to diapers, slave to maybe some of the other ladies feeding the dogs and the cats, you know. Sometimes you do feel like a slave. But we, when you think about it, we are all employed, really. We're either an employer or, by the Lord, we are homemakers or employees. And most of us are in charge of something, right? We're in charge of something or someone. Either we are someone's boss or we rule our kids or employ others to do work in our home. So more than likely, we've all been the, in the position of a slave or a master. So as we think about our biblical responsibilities, whether master or slave, let's ask ourselves some very thought-provoking questions. Is your service in whatever role you play as unto the Lord? Is your attitude one of a cheerful and a sincere heart with a view to please God? Do you do your work as if God were standing next to you? By the way, he is. <laughs> do you do your jobs half-heartedly? Are you lazy in your housework, cooking, or any other tasks that you do? Are you spending time on social media texting your 4,000 friends when you should be managing your home <laughs> or using that time to love the Lord and love his people? Do you have before your mind's eye that you will receive reward or loss of reward for those things you've done in your body, good or bad? For those of you who are employers or bosses or head of something, do you treat your employees harshly by threatening to fire them if they don't straighten up? <laughs> Do you lead your employees with a sincere and cheerful heart, realizing the eye of the Lord is upon you? Have you remembered you're a bondservant of Christ? <laughs> you're a slave of the Lord. Do you realize you too have a master in heaven that you're going to be accountable to? Well, whether bond or free, master or slave, employee or employer, we all as believers, should say a hearty amen to the following quote. I thought this was good. Thank God every morning when you get up that you have something to do which must be done, whether you like it or not. <laughs> Being forced to work and forced to do your best will breed in you a hundred virtues which the idol will never know. Ladies, God made us to work, and I hope you enjoy your work, whether you're in charge of something or whether you work for someone and do it hardly as unto the Lord it's it's such a good uh, I don't like the word feeling but isn't it good to know at night when you put your head on your pillow that you've done something productive uh, during the day and so God made us to work and we should do it with a joyful cheerful heart and treat others with the same respect that we would like to be treated so let's pray together Father thank you again for uh, allowing us the opportunity to use our minds and our bodies for the jobs you've called us to do, and everyone in here, Lord, has different giftings. They, we all have different responsibilities. Some are young women. Uh, some have raised our children, and now we're grandmothers, and some of us work uh, outside the home. Some of us work from the home. But, Lord, whatever it is, I pray that we would always do our work as unto you and not unto men, knowing that we will receive the reward of our inheritance, for we serve the Lord Christ ultimately. And help us to treat one another with dignity and respect and integrity, Father. Thank you for this time together and blessing our group time, Lord. And
pray that we could um, encourage each other and help each other. In Christ's name, amen.